Our anime starts off bloody and tense. We see a young boy named Toka Mamori being scolded by his father, who not only yells at him but also starts hitting him. The boy can only apologize as he is beaten, while his mother seems more interested in her afternoon soap opera than in her son. The boy endures until he passes out. When he opens his eyes, we see him as an older version of himself, waking up from a nightmare during a school trip. One of his classmates is upset because a boy named Oyamata took a girl's romantic novel. She complains loudly, making the whole bus aware of what she likes. This annoys other students like Tomohiko Yasu, who feels bad for her, while others don't seem to care. They just want the school trip to distract them from their tough daily lives. Among the students, we have Hijiri Takao, who treats her sister Itsuki like a servant, even though she calls her boss. Another student, Kabato Kashima, is also not happy with the bus drama as Oyamata continues to bother the girl who just wants her book back. Our protagonist remembers how the class representative had a hard time in the past. He felt sorry for her but knew it was unavoidable. The only normal people on the bus seem to be the Takao sisters and their teacher, Tamatsu Sakuraji. Despite everything, Ayaka tries to get her book back. Oyamata agrees to return it if she accepts him on a social network called Rain. As the situation escalates, our protagonist, Toka Mimori, unexpectedly asks Oyamata to stop the show. This surprises both Oyamata and Toka himself, who doesn't know why he stood up to help Ayaka but tries to get the book back peacefully, which only causes more laughter. In the end, another student, Takuto, steps in and asks Oyamata to stop, but Oyamata is just getting started. What better way to pass time on a boring trip than by bothering a nobody? However, Takuto didn't want to waste his time on a true nobody like our protagonist, so he declined to help. Still, he insisted on getting the book back, which impressed another student, Asajai Kasaba, who respected Takuto a lot. Even Oyamata quickly returned the book to Ayaka and apologized for going too far, though he was secretly unhappy about it. He started hitting Tomohiko's seat, frustrated that another loser like Toka dared to confront him. Finally, their teacher shouted for silence, reminding everyone that this was supposed to be a peaceful school trip. Despite everything, Toka knew Oyamata was right, under normal circumstances, he would never have stood up like that. Remembering a bit of his past, Toka couldn't help but take action. As the trip continued, a strange light began to shine inside the bus until it completely disappeared, leaving all the students in a mysterious place where a woman greeted them and called them heroes. She introduced herself as the goddess Viseus and explained that they had been summoned to the kingdom of Alien because a great demon empire was about to start a war. Whenever this happens, new heroes are called upon to help the kingdom. She told them how heroes had defeated evil 200 years ago and continued to do so. The queen asked for their strength and support. While some students thought this was just a bad joke and others believed it was a dream, their teacher asked them to stay calm and pay attention to the goddess, who had captivated their interest. For Toka, it still felt like another dream, just like the one he had that morning, and he tried to wake up again. Takuto and Oyamata's group didn't waste any time and immediately asked if they were summoned to defeat unknown demons. The queen confirmed this, emphasizing that if they didn't complete the task, they would never return to their old world. This wasn't a threat but a fact. According to the goddess, the spell to return them home could only be recreated with the essence of the Dark Lord, which could be obtained in two ways, directly from the heart of the demon king or by using an iron pendant she showed them, which could absorb the demon's essence. Oyamata thought this was ridiculous since either way, they would have to face the demon king. The goddess showed respect by bowing to the heroes and asking for their help. This prompted Ayaka to ask the obvious question, how are ordinary humans expected to defeat powerful demons, especially without any prior experience? The goddess assured them that this wouldn't be a problem because she believed they all had something special since the hero spell had chosen them. This infuriated Oyamata even more, and as he complained, the castle soldiers brought in a strange beast that devoured an innocent man in front of the entire class. The goddess used this to demonstrate her power, making the class realize that this was no joke. Accepting their new reality, Hijiri proposed that they decide what to do next. The queen invited them to discover their abilities. The first student to go didn't receive anything special, and most of the class didn't get notable abilities either. Oyamata, however, was an exception and received a powerful crimson light. This was outdone by Takuto, whose golden light shattered the evaluation crystal. The queen congratulated him for easily obtaining an S rank, which meant special. Oyamata, feeling jealous, found out he had an A rank. Then another crystal was shattered by Ayaka, who also received an S rank. Hijiri got an A rank, and her sister became the third consecutive S rank in the class, making the goddess extremely pleased with her summon group. Finally, it was Toka's turn. He saw a strange violet color, making him the only one whose crystal didn't shine like his classmates. The goddess had the final word, 
so she struck the young woman until she fainted. The rest of the class did nothing, which enraged Toka. He tried to attack the goddess, but his only ability couldn't even touch her because she had an impenetrable shield activated all the time. However, Takuto managed to pierce the shield with a trial shot. With everything said and no one opposing, the goddess asked Toka for his last words. He recalled more of his past, or he was beaten and developed an alternate personality to survive his hellish life. This internal version told him never to hold back again. In the present, Toka finally listened and insulted the goddess in the worst way in front of his classmates. Despite this, he was sent to the waste ruins. Upon arriving, he encountered a strange demon that chased him until he could run no more. After stumbling in with no other options, Toka remembered his immobilization ability, successfully stopping the demon. He seized the chance to run away as fast as he could. However, another demon, this time a bird, appeared right in front of him. He used immobilization again, which worked very well, and noticed that these abilities consumed his mana points. With no other options, he used poison on the monster, discovering that while he wasn't very strong, he could mix immobilization and poison to survive. Using abilities drained his energy, which he quickly felt. As he struggled, the first demon reappeared, and Toka realized he had no way out. He knew this was the perfect moment for someone to save him, but also knew this was real life. He accepted his fate, knowing he was never meant to live in this world where the goddess's world, or his classmates didn't care about his banishment. Remembering more of his harsh childhood where he was beaten, something awakened inside Toka, and he seemed ready to face whatever came next. Without fear of running out of life points, Toka cast his paralyzing spell on one of the beasts stalking him. However, the spell had no effect, and his system alerted him to the problem. The same technique cannot be cast on the same target multiple times. In a desperate final act, he used a sleep spell, which worked perfectly and saved his life by putting the beast to sleep. Attempting a different approach, he found that the spells could stack with each other, but this didn't change the fact that his mana points were at zero and the enemies remained a significant threat. With multiple consecutive paralyzing spells, he managed to significantly reduce his enemy's health. Tuka was on the verge of passing out from fatigue, surrounded by terrifying moments as more enemies approached. With death seemingly seconds away, our protagonist chose the path of the warrior, casting all the paralyzing spells he could. This brought him to his limit, but luckily it gave him enough XP to level up to level 2, where his mana points were restored and multiplied tenfold. Tuka wondered how he had leveled up, recognizing the beast he had recently defeated. It made no sense to him that he had gained so much experience from a single kill. This could only mean one thing, so he immediately began defeating as many enemies as possible, quickly leveling up again. The system not only rewarded him with magic points but also upgraded his abilities with new advantages, such as targeting multiple enemies at once. This allowed him to stop all the beasts in an instant. Despite saving his life, Tuka couldn't shake a strange feeling. Although his new ability was powerful, it still couldn't compare to the goddess who had condemned him to death. Realizing he had more to uncover, our protagonist tried casting the paralyzing spell on a defeated enemy again, only for his system to remind him that it wasn't possible. Since the beast had already been affected by the spell before, Tuka had no choice but to poison all the beasts. Remember, spells can stack, and this led to another level up. Tuka was thrilled with his achievements, and when he checked his system, he noticed all his abilities had been multiplied by his level. His magic points had skyrocketed, which was great news since they powered his spells. As another beast died near him, his points multiplied excessively, reaching level 321 with ease. The poison had just begun to take effect on the enemy beasts, causing his level to continue climbing. To speed up the process, Tuka used his new sleep ability, which also leveled up quickly with repeated use. Despite reaching level 501, Tuka knew he couldn't be complacent, he had to survive to exact his revenge on the goddess. Unfortunately, his enemies fled upon realizing his power. An old adventurer perished in an attempt to survive, and Tuka took his belongings. Continuing his journey, Tuka encountered more beasts. Although he defeated them, hunger remained a problem. He attempted to eat one of the beasts, but their tough skin forced him to find a different part, like the eye, to consume. The meat was acidic and tasted horrible, leaving Tuka with no other options. Desperate, he ate the eye, which confirmed that the beast's bodies were acidic. Tuka began to accept his defeat in the dungeon. However, the survival bag he had been given started to change color mysteriously. Investigating it, he found junk food inside, which delighted the starving boy. He wasn't sure how it worked or if the bag would provide food again. Days passed in this hellish environment. Tuka continued to poison and defeat groups of enemies, leveling up repeatedly due to his massacre. However, the constant violence began to affect his mind. Despite being human and unaccustomed to such acts, memories from his childhood resurfaced. He remembered vowing at a young age to delete his mother's abusive boyfriend. Just then, a light appeared before him, and two people emerged, apologizing for taking so long to rescue him. These two were his uncles, who gave him a normal home for the first time in his life and offered to be the parents he never had. 
These memories flooded back to him, and as he reflected on the massacre and terror he had caused, he wondered if he truly felt remorse. However, his mind seemed to ignore these thoughts, leading him to believe he might be destined to be a monster. With his system open, Tuka reviewed all his achievements and quickly accepted his new self, realizing the old Tuka was gone since being left to die in the dungeon. Continuing his journey, he found more fallen adventurers and an ancient sword, feeling only respect for them. He dedicated a minute of silence to their memory before moving on. Even new monsters no longer surprised him, paralyzing them and using poison, he could defeat them swiftly. Exploring further, Tuka discovered that the area he was in was different from where he usually wandered. He found a blue gem that seemed to require some magic. Using his mana, he activated it perfectly, opening a door to reveal more adventurers who had perished in their escape from the dungeon. Among them were likely two lovers who had chosen to die together. Tuka paid his respects and noticed they carried several blue gems, which he decided to take, hoping they might be useful. Time passed as he examined many doors, finally reaching one that required an immense amount of mana to open. When the doors finally opened, he was met with the same tragic scene but now featuring an adventurer with fresh wounds. In the adventurer's hand, Tuka found a note, which he could read thanks to his system's translation abilities. The letter revealed that the skeleton was once Anlin Bard, a great sage known as Anglin the Dark Hero. This name reminded Tuka of a time when Yasu gained his powers, and the goddess Vias mentioned the great dark hero who had once saved their world. However, the note presented a different story. Anglin explained that the goddess had sent him to the dungeon because he was no longer needed in their world and had become a nuisance. In a final attempt to leave a clue for future adventurers, Anglin left a few words. Tuka was overwhelmed by the realization of the atrocities committed by the goddess Vias. She had always portrayed the demonic empire as the villains, but her actions were not much different from theirs. Tuka began to understand that he might not be so different, as his desire for revenge was consuming him. The confrontation of evil against evil became clear in his mind. Among Anglin's possessions, Tuka found a hero's book filled with forbidden arts, recipes for medicines, and magical tools, which could be useful in the future. He also discovered a scroll of forbidden magic, though he couldn't read it. He wondered why a sage would guard such a relic, suspecting that deciphering it would grant immense power, possibly rivaling the queen herself. Before leaving, Tuka read more of the hero's book, which warned about the Soul Eater, a creature that had killed many. A quick vision of the Soul Eater appeared, but this did not deter Tuka. He continued exploring the area, noting a strange door that seemed to require a unique object to open. He suspected this object was connected to the Soul Eater, which might be the key to his escape. Checking his stats, Tuka felt confident in his high level. As he approached the door, it transformed into a face that immediately shot at him, warning him to be cautious against the Soul Eater. Despite the warning, Tuka decided to strategize and possibly level up further before confronting the creature. He realized that if the most powerful hero of the past couldn't defeat the Soul Eater, reaching this point might have been a grave mistake. As if things weren't already terrifying enough, the Soul Eater began to spew a strange substance from its mouth, which transformed into the final expressions of each of its victims, traumatizing Tuka further. The creature seemed to enjoy this moment immensely. It didn't attack Tuka directly, but the sight of these human replicas being poisoned tore his mind apart. Hurting what were essentially remnants of humans caused Tuka a great deal of stress, much to the delight of the Soul Eater, which summoned more human replicas to torment him. Unable to bear the horrific scene, Tuka noticed that the creature was laughing hysterically. Taking advantage of this distraction, he analyzed the Soul Eater, managing to deceive it just enough to launch a surprise attack. This clever maneuver caused his paralyzing spell to level up to three. Throughout this ordeal, Tuka thought of his uncles, who had given him the best life possible. He wondered if they had misunderstood his true intentions, and out of respect for them, he wanted to change who he was. However, in this new world, he realized he had to revert to his true self. After all, he was just a simple human who had managed to confront a legendary dungeon beast. It was time to finish the beast. Using his poison, which had also leveled up to three, Tuka defeated the Soul Eater. With the creature destroyed, he freed the souls of the fallen adventurers, who thanked him for avenging them before passing on to the afterlife. Among them was the soul of Anglin, who asked Tuka to defeat the goddess for him before departing. With the beast's gem in hand, Tuka vowed to fulfill this request. After many days, he had completed the first step of his plan, escaping the dungeon. Beyond this world, we witnessed a dangerous wolf being chased by Oyamata, who almost caught the beast. However, it didn't surrender easily. Another companion, Takuto, found it less challenging to defeat these creatures due to his superior power, he is already at level 18. Meanwhile, Yasu, newly chosen as the Dark Knight, managed to defeat his opponents, nearly losing his mind with his newfound powers. On the other side, Kabato struggled with taking lives. Ikusaba appeared, urging her to be more ruthless if she didn't want to die, and requested to be called by her name, Asagi, instead of her surname. Asagi also informed her that the group would soon split up, which made sense given their established ranks. She was abundant in the present, and Asagi hoped Kabato would join her group when the time came. Although Kabato seemed unsure, Asagi reminded her that she was a Class B and that a Class D girl like Kabato would never join an S-Class group. 
She mentioned Tuka, implying Kabato's innocence in understanding the situation. Asajai then took a direct approach, touching Kabato and making it clear that they could use whatever strengths Kabato had in this lawless world. With that, the rest of the girls brought a small, shackled monster for Kabato to kill, reminding her of the goddess's trial. Reluctantly, Kabato ended the creature's life, earning her a place in Asajai's group. This act was painful for the kind-hearted Kabato, who never wanted to live in this world, recalling her old cat that had once been hit by a car but was cared for by a kind duke, bringing tears to her eyes. Elsewhere, Ayaka woke up with a severe stomach pain, remembering it was from being struck by the goddess for opposing her decision to send a friend into a dangerous dungeon. With no other choice, she bravely went to see the goddess to seek answers. The goddess, shedding completely fake tears, began to apologize, claiming she would never do this if not for the sacred ritual that demanded adherence to ancient rules. Without these rules, her kingdom would never survive. Remembering she had been asleep for several days, she realized this presented a new problem. Her companions had significantly leveled up while she slept, and some couldn't even harm a monster. They needed to be eliminated immediately since heroes unable to fulfill their duties were useless. Ayaka interpreted this as a mandate to kill the weak, and the queen didn't deny it, stating it was her world's rules. Without these rules, she wouldn't harm a fly. Ayaka was furious and openly criticized the goddess for her cruel methods toward those who couldn't be heroes. The goddess found this amusing, accepting that the world had weak people who wouldn't understand her grand decisions. However, eliminating the useless was necessary. As an S-class, Ayaka promised to improve and excel in all areas, not just for herself but for the students who couldn't pass their trials. This was practically a deal with the goddess, who acknowledged it was a good idea and asked for a quick reconciliation, admitting the recent hit was hasty and senseless but necessary due to the uproar caused. With a firm handshake, all was forgiven. Upon leaving the room, Ayaka could only confirm that the goddess had the coldest hands she had ever touched. Meanwhile, a mysterious figure ran through the forest, chased by a strange group. A sinister-looking man named Blighting seemed to have found her trail, while another, Ashura, called out to the hidden princess knight, promising not to harm her. Sengai, another thug, ruined the ruse by suggesting they kill her, and Sarage, another pursuer, demanded the group focus, reminding them they were the sacred vigilantes, and no one had ever escaped them. Back to Tuka, who saw sunlight for the first time in ages, he quickly checked his system, noting he was now at level 1789 with over 59,000 mana points. He was interested in whether he could nullify his paralysis spell at will and stop his poison spell before it killed an enemy. This would need testing on a forest enemy. He knew he needed a powerful sword for close combat. Hearing a strange noise, Tuka investigated, finding wild slimes bullying a smaller one. He noted that this was life and there was nothing to do against it. However, when the small slime defended itself, Tuka was pleased and used paralysis and poison spells to see if a hidden menu existed. It did, allowing him to release the bullying slimes, who fled upon seeing Tuka's strength. Before freeing the small slime, Tuka praised it for defending itself and, surprisingly, the slime chose to follow him, likely because it was an OU Tukast like him. Finally, the exhausted princess realized she had enough time to formulate a plan to save herself. The small slime stayed with Tuka, serving as a rear guard in his hood, a benefit for the young man who knew befriending the slime was wise. Reading a book on forbidden techniques, Tuka found a spell to enhance monsters, which he hoped would benefit his new friend. But first, he needed to clarify things. Tuka revealed to the little slime that following him would mean facing many enemies, as his journey was one of complete vengeance. With this warning, the slime understood and accepted, and Tuka named him Pigamaru, a name the little slime loved. With clear determination, Tuka set his sights on the princess's castle, the one who had tried to kill him. Meanwhile, the princess hadn't gained as much time as she thought, with her pursuers hot on her heels. With no other option, she drew her sword to fight, invoking the grace of all the spirits she could. However, the thugs weren't after her, they encountered Tuka instead. Sheriz demanded all his valuables to spare his life, while Bidden wanted to kill him to satisfy his thirst for vengeance. The rest of the thugs argued over who would finish off Tuka, which made him angry, but he restrained himself. As they spoke of a woman and their vile plans for her, Tuka cowardly begged for his life. Taking advantage of the moment, he used his paralysis spell right before being struck, revealing that his ability worked on humans too, with perhaps only the goddess being immune. Remembering his past fear in the dungeon, Tuka realized he was no longer the weak person he once was. He swiftly decided to eliminate his enemies without remorse, using his poison spell. After the fight, Tuka sensed another presence nearby. Meanwhile, the princess wondered why she no longer felt her enemies. She cut through a bush and found Pigamaru, but Tuka quickly paralyzed her, noticing her strong bloodlust. Curious, he wanted to talk to her, being new to this world and lost, hoping for some help. The princess, despite being paralyzed, asked about the four people near her. Using his system, Tuka sped up her speech. Apologizing but cautious, he revealed he had killed them, surprising her since they were sacred vigilantes. Grateful for his honesty, she promised to answer his questions in return. After some conversation, Tuka learned he was now in the kingdom of Ulsa, far from Alien, 
or the princess had originally sent him. For his last question, Toka asked about his mysterious scroll, but the princess couldn't read it. However, she mentioned someone who might be able to, the Witch of the Kingdom, located in the land of the Golden-Eyed Monsters. With no further questions, Toka bid her farewell, assuring her that his spell would wear off in a few minutes. This made the princess happy, who wished him a good journey, reminding Toka of his kind aunt. As they left, Pigamaro asked why they didn't kill the princess, to which Toka replied that he never kills without reason and that they should move quickly to avoid her coming after them once freed. Pigamaro accepted his new mission to watch their backs, like a soldier. Tuka quickly moved on to see how he arrived in a city where he was a total stranger. As he concealed his intentions, he informed the security guard that he was just there to explore the city of Mills. Despite being unknown, they let him through without much trouble, as they needed explorers for the city's ruins. Once inside, everything seemed to be going well for the young man, who headed straight to an inn for a unique personal room, which cost 2,000 marks per night. The skeptical innkeeper initially thought he couldn't afford it, but upon seeing the money, he quickly began treating him like royalty. When asked his name, our protagonist realized he needed to protect his identity and quickly invented the name Hattie Skull to blend in unnoticed in the city. After reaching his room, he laid out all his belongings and planned to explore the city of Mills further. As he explored, he noticed it resembled cities from video games, suggesting that the Adventurer's Guild might be nearby. Feeling hungry, he decided to eat a delicious, otherworldly soup, surrounded by cheerful people, which reassured him that arriving in such a peaceful city was a good decision. However, while listening to a drunkard at the tavern, he learned that all countries on the continent had powerful armies, making it difficult to determine which was the best. Names like the Mad Empress were mentioned due to their undefeated combat record. By the end of the discussion, the drunken patrons agreed that the Black Dragon Knights were superior to all, as this army had defeated an entire empire with its five leaders who used dragons in battle. This information gave our protagonist a better understanding of the kind of place he was in. Returning to his accommodation, he didn't forget his small companion, so he planned to have dinner. While eating, he started listing things to do, beginning with finding someone who could truly read the forbidden hero scroll he had discovered in the cave. Based on the information he had from a young woman he recently met, he knew he needed to find the taboo which in the land of the golden monsters, not forgetting that the monster enhancer should also be nearby, and it would be even better than Pigamaru. Remembering the recent conversation with the drunkards, they mentioned that the city was very lively with the Marquis of the Ruins, who had discovered a new dungeon filled with thousands of new items. The magical recipe book indicated that creating a booster from scratch required a king skeleton bone, which conveniently could be found in the dungeons of Mills, the city they were currently in. So, investigating this further wouldn't be a bad idea. The next morning, the city's marquee, named Crit, was seen. He was the renowned sage everyone knew and had simply thanked all the adventurers who would risk exploring the new ruins discovered by Aaron. He also presented a dragon eye chalice, which he desired, and finding it would earn a generous reward of 300 gold coins. Other legendary treasures would also be paid for, with the freedom to keep any monster item they desired. Took a promise to put in the effort, knowing that the king skeleton's dust could be obtained without much trouble. This led him directly to the registration, where he had to stand in a long line. In this line, Tuka noticed a strange individual with a mushroom-like haircut who was bothering a nearby young woman. According to this peculiar man, she had the same voice as a captain from a certain nation who had recently put a bounty on her. The mushroom-headed man knew for sure she was the one, as he had met her in the past, but she had grotesquely rejected him. He believed she had the same voice and a good heart as before. The young woman asked him to leave, but the strange man, actually named Monk, insisted on seeing her face. Without permission, Monk uncovered the young woman's face, only to find someone very different from who he had expected. The young woman, confirming that he was mistaken, introduced herself as Miss Balkas. Tuka remembered her from their previous encounter in the forest. After registering, Tuka decided to explore the city to find a few missing items for his small companion. He ran into the young woman from the forest again, who asked for a moment to chat. This time, she just wanted to know why he was in the city. Tuka admitted he wanted to meet the Marquis to understand how difficult it was to explore a ruin. The young woman, Miss Balkas, suggested that perhaps she shouldn't make herself easily hated by strangers, as it could lead to trouble. Despite this, she seemed indifferent, claiming she knew how to protect herself. Taking advantage of her familiarity with the city, Tuka asked her for a favor to buy some equipment for exploring ruins. He was concerned that new arrivals to the city might be scammed, and he needed her help to avoid this problem, offering a sum of money for her assistance. The young woman didn't deny that she needed some funds for her personal journey, so the deal and the introduction were made promptly. Tuka, still introducing himself as Hutti to stay safe, noticed that he was dealing with someone who was also using a false name. She confirmed this, explaining that both were using different names for protection, which was not unusual. Once in the market, with the young woman's help, Tuka managed to acquire everything he needed at a decent price. He paid her three silver coins for her advice, which seemed a lot to Miss Balkas. However, Tuka knew that those coins, or even more, could easily have been spent on any schemer. Although the young woman was pleased, 
she also appeared extremely weak, having not slept for several days. To avoid causing further inconvenience, she quickly left, leaving Tuka free to head straight to the new dungeon. Upon arrival, he encountered a group of adventurers fleeing from a lesser beast. This creature was nothing to Tuka, who easily subdued it with a couple of strikes, noting that it resembled the giant minotaurs he had faced earlier. Even its skin was incredibly soft compared to the steel-like height of the beasts he had fought in the ruins of waste. The cowards among the adventurers returned with another adventurer, only to find that the beast was already dead. While they were surprised, Tuka simply thought that the beasts were quite weak, despite being from the latest discovered dungeon in the city. Checking his system menu, he noted that they also provided extremely little experience. A few hours later, Tuka overheard Monk talking with other adventurers. Specifically, Monk was negotiating with them to find Miss Balkas, seeking revenge for having been embarrassed recently. The other lecherous adventurers were quick to agree, eager to have some fun with the voluptuous woman before ending her life. Tuka, however, was displeased by this. He bravely approached the group of degenerates and called them a bunch of failures, which, unsurprisingly, angered them. The group quickly wanted to finish Tuka off, so he immediately begged for mercy, not wanting to come across as too arrogant. Monk began to laugh, saying it was too late, and Tuka was now exposed to the paralysis spell. Tuka quickly began questioning whom they intended to harm. This behavior reminded him of those who had hurt him in the past, causing the poison to swiftly affect his enemies. Dealing with scum like them had become a new amusement for Tuka, who listened as Monk vowed to make him suffer as soon as he could move again. Tuka, however, only laughed, knowing that the soon-to-be-dead wouldn't even be able to touch him once the poison took effect. If the poison didn't work, the monsters that emerged from the dungeon would take care of them. With one problem out of the way, Tuka continued his descent, realizing he had only one more floor to reach his destination. He decided to rest briefly, which turned out to be a literal three hours, thanks to the protection provided by Pigamaru. Once back on his quest, he encountered the Sable Tigers, a group that informed him of something extremely strange happening in these ruins, monsters were dying for no apparent reason. Subcaptain Foss explained that it made no sense for the beasts to have no cuts on their bodies, yet someone seemed to be killing them. Their captain, Lily, decided it wasn't safe to stay due to the new threat and chose to leave. Tuka, however, knew who the mysterious figure responsible for the beast deaths was. Continuing through the floors, Tuka finally spotted a reward, the dragon eye chalice was right in front of him. However, it was likely guarded by some kind of trap. With a frozen dragon nearby, he used a preventive paralysis and poison to secure the chalice. Even though the beast had been destroyed, Miss Balkas appeared behind him, lamenting having arrived minutes before Tuka. She had lost a lot of money just from resting. Despite this, Tuka, always humble and kind, offered to give her the chalice if she truly needed it. The young woman, unsure of what to do, asked what he wanted in return, as 300 gold coins seemed too much. Tuka, the generous adventurer, was willing to help without asking for anything in return, especially for lovely ladies, according to Tuka himself. For Miss, accepting so much help from the young man was a blow to her honor. When she learned that he was looking for a higher level monster, she quickly offered to become his bodyguard as a token of gratitude. Tuka, noticing that she genuinely wanted to contribute, reluctantly agreed to her help. However, he set a small rule, they would avoid asking questions that could reveal their true circumstances, and if necessary, they would die in the process. Miss bravely accepted these conditions, promising to protect Tuka even at the cost of her life. With that settled, she began her work, defeating a large beast on her own, which impressed Tuka. He couldn't help but ask about the golden monsters, to which she explained that they were so named because they provided more experience, especially to heroes from other worlds who, for some reason, did not gain experience from killing people. Specifically, these monsters were the best option for gaining experience, which reminded Tuka why those creatures hadn't given him any experience before. She also mentioned that these monsters were enhanced because they absorbed a bit of the Demon King's energy, a term that reminded Tuka of his companions, who should now be training to defeat him. With no more to discuss, they continued exploring, but with so much work ahead, it was time to rest. Tuka, their favorite guard, would take over the watch. It was then that Miss met Pigamaru for the first time. While she slept, Pigamaru would keep watch, but since Tuka knew Miss would resist, he used a sleep spell on her. He watched as the young woman's spell gradually wore off, revealing that she was indeed the Sarah's Ash Rain. Returning to the forest from last time, a group of explorers wondered who could have defeated the four sacred guardians in such a short time. The most powerful human in the world, Sivit Garland, seemed more excited than worried upon learning that someone so strong was so close to him. Returning to the dungeon, we find Ash Rain, waking from a long nap. Upon waking, she meets up with Tuka and Pigamaro, who are ready to continue exploring. Feeling well rested, they move to the next door, finding no threats inside a suspicious occurrence. Suddenly, a noise alerts them, and they run as fast as they can, only to be confronted by a massive skeleton. This isn't just any skeleton, they face the Skeleton King. Tuka knows this enemy is far more powerful than the other beasts they've encountered and considers avoiding it. However, when Ashrain notices a silver piece in the beast's jaw, possibly its weak point, they reconsider fleeing. 
The Skeleton King seems to regard Ashrain as the only threat. Before confronting the beast, Ashrain asks Tuka not to reveal the technique she's about to use, as it boosts all her base stats significantly and is best kept secret. Tuka agrees, while the Skeleton King prepares a powerful annihilation beam. Tuka paralyzes the beast using his ability, gaining experience from defeating powerful creatures. After a few minutes, the poison takes effect, giving them victory and the item needed for Pigamaru. This act of strength raises many questions for Ashrain, which Tuka promises to answer once they're back on the surface, as he's tired of the dungeons. Before leaving, Pigamaro senses an unknown presence. Upon investigation, they discover a strange item held by a skeleton, which, when touched, releases a magical seal revealing an egg. Pigamaro insists they take it to the surface. Nearby, other adventurers, former friends of Tuka, are fleeing from dangerous skeletal knights. One of them, Sakura, has lost a hand in battle. Kashima reassures her that the goddess can heal the wound. Sago, despite his fear, knows he must protect his companions. As they prepare to fight the beasts, Oyamata appears, using a powerful fire fist spell to annihilate the skeletons. With Takuto's help, the spell is even more devastating, though it almost harms their companions. The overwhelming power begins to corrupt them, a troubling sight for their friends. Meanwhile, NEA displays the Dragon Eye Chalice, a valuable prize from the dungeon. With her goals achieved, she has no reason to stay in the city. Ashrain talks to Tuka, mentioning a grand ceremony in his honor the next day, where he will receive a reward. Ashrain agrees to meet Tuka later in the evening, appreciating the gift of the Dragon Eye Chalice he gave her. Later, while Pigamaro feeds, Tuka finishes a monster enhancer that could potentially boost his little friend. Ashrain arrives to discuss becoming Tuka's bodyguard, as she believes it could be a profitable venture. She subtly hints at the chalice to gain his approval and reveals their next objective, the Witch of Taboos, located near the land of golden-eyed monsters. As it's a dangerous place, they consider bringing a skilled swordswoman. Ashrain plans to head to the Duchy of Janato and contemplates Tuka's proposal. Tuka, trying to reassure her, reveals that he put her to sleep earlier in the ruins and saw her true form. Concerned, Ashrain asks him to keep her identity secret, and he agrees. In a gesture of trust, Tuka reveals his true name, which Ashrain promises to keep secret. She, in turn, introduces herself properly as Sarah's Ashrain, an elf and former captain of NEA's knights. She finally accepts the role of Tuka's guardian, marking a significant step in their growing trust. As their first payment, Tuka gave Ashrain a strange blue gem, which surprised her greatly, it was a rare blue dragon gem. Upon recalling, Tuka mentioned that he had found it from a pair of adventurers in the past and asked if it was valuable. Ashrain quickly informed him that it was, as these gems are only produced by the scarcely seen blue-eyed dragons, making it likely more valuable than the dragon eye chalice. Although she initially refused the gem, feeling it was too generous a payment, Tuka insisted, leaving her no choice but to accept. Ashrain then revealed a bit more about herself, admitting she was a fugitive in this world. Tuka, unfazed, reassured her that her past did not concern him, and he didn't press for details to avoid making her uncomfortable. This attitude was well received by Ashrain, who later, while preparing a meal, pondered Tuka's considerate words. The next day, as they were having breakfast, a couple of men began harassing Ashrain, insinuating that she wasn't hard to seduce. Although this angered her, Tuka knew that such remarks were meaningless and chose to change the subject by asking about forbidden magic. Ashrain explained that the goddess Viseus had banned these ancient spells long ago, likely because they were harmful. This information piqued Tuka's curiosity, but without further details from Ashrain, there wasn't much more to discuss. As they parted ways before the ceremony, Tuka prepared for an experiment he had planned. However, during the ceremony, Ashrain noticed that Tuka was nowhere to be seen. A mysterious figure appeared, bringing in an expert to authenticate the Dragon Eye Chalice before awarding the prize. Meanwhile, the goddess expressed relief that her warriors were safe and promised to heal Sakura's severed hand. She offered Sago a position in Takuto's team due to her abilities. Sago declined, haunted by the memory of the beasts they had become, which displeased the goddess. She called Sago selfish for not doing what was best for their world but ultimately respected her decision. However, she warned Sago that she must now train her lower-ranked companions, a daunting task, especially with the threat of the goddess eliminating any heroes who refused to fight. Elsewhere, Tuka found it odd that Ashrain wasn't at their agreed meeting spot and went looking for her. He overheard two people discussing the woman with the chalice, revealing that she was the fugitive they had been searching for. Realizing the truth behind her absence, he witnessed the arrival of the Black Dragon Knights, who were sent to capture Ashrain. Cornered and seeing no other option, Ashrain decided to fight seriously, immediately taking down one dragon and then another, showcasing her true strength as a former royal knight. However, the battle was far from over, as the dragons and their riders, including Gizan, the sub-captain of the dragon squadron, persisted. Exhausted and unable to use her stat-boosting abilities, Ashrain questioned whether fleeing her nation was enough reason for them to kill her. Gizan, confident of victory, revealed that these were secret orders from higher-ups. As Ashrain struggled, Tuka intervened, paralyzing Gizan and even stopping the great dragon. He confronted Ashrain, asking why she had stood him up, 
while using a non-lethal poison on Gizan to prevent him from dying. Toka put Gizan to sleep to avoid eavesdropping on their conversation. Ashrain, realizing she would always be hunted by dangerous knights, apologized and tried to return the upfront payment for her protection. However, Toka, unwilling to go through the hassle of finding another bodyguard as skilled as her, gave her a bag full of blue dragon jams, expressing his desire for her to stay as his bodyguard. Despite the precarious situation, Tuka remained committed to keeping her by his side. And before impure thoughts could take control, we see that this request was made only because Ashrain had been seen wearing the same clothes for too long, making everyone in Mills a potential threat. However, Ashrain didn't understand why her new friend was talking as if they were going on the journey together. To convince her, he suggested that the Witch of Taboos would grant one of his wishes when they both found her. Even though there was no clear evidence of the witch's existence, since their path led to the land of monsters, it was convenient for Ashrain to go alone. Before agreeing, Ashrain wanted to know why she was receiving so much help from him. He admitted that she reminded him too much of an old friend from his past, speaking almost exactly the same way and having a similar personality. With this aura, it was nearly impossible for him to ignore her. At the end of the day, leaving her here completely alone would be like committing a sin, so seeing Tuka's determination, the young woman accepted the deal. Just as one of the dragons died, a level increase came to the young man's system, allowing him to unmute the poison knight. Although the knight had his pride as part of an elite team, Tuka knew he couldn't let things go after everything that had happened. This was resolved when Ashrain asked who sent the knight to kill her. For the sheer pleasure of seeing her reaction, the soldier revealed that she, being a high-level elf princess, had sworn complete devotion to the sanctity of the kingdom but was betrayed. Before he could reveal the traitor's name, a sword ended his life, leaving the secret to die with him and leaving Tuka trembling as uncertainty began to eat away at her. Before we see what happens with our protagonist, we flash back to a scene with Sivet, the knight in white armor, considered the strongest man in the world. He seemed to make a request to the king, but the important thing now is that they would have to face the five legendary dragons. Meanwhile, Tuka wondered where the fifth was, but it was revealed that their captain had already killed him, as Sivet believed no member should be driven by emotions during combat, especially when receiving orders from someone as important as Ordola, the very king of the nation to which Ashrain had dedicated her loyalty. Ashrain had a rather sweet view of him as a king or at least respected him, but he was just an obsessive being who, since the first time he saw her, became completely enamored despite his age. The old man would do anything to be with Ashrain, even sending an elite team to kidnap her. After a long time of Ashrain fleeing, the orders changed to eliminating her because the Mad Elder wanted to satisfy his desire that if she isn't mine, she'll be no one's. With this revelation, Ashrain understood that the Emperor had always been behind all her troubles. Now, a decision had to be made. Another member of the Black Dragons, named Shills, reminded her that at this point, they could take her life, but it would be a waste because she was too beautiful. Another member reminded them that because of Ortola's madness, it was best not to lay a finger on her after taking her life. This was the last straw for the young woman, who couldn't understand how they could talk so calmly about doing such horrible things to her. Seizing the moment, the strongest one, Sivet, gave her a chance to retain her right to live, something she didn't fully understand. So, Shills made it clear that their squad leader was challenging her to a duel. To survive, she would have to defeat the strongest of them all. In the background, we see another member named Matama laughing at her options because it was either perish or perish. However, upon further reflection, the squad leader remembered that when they appeared, his former companion had been captured by the young man beside her, leaving Tuka with all of Sivet's attention and in a situation between a rock and a hard place. This was because Tuka recognized the monster in front of her just by its presence, which was much greater than even that of Almas. But this brought a small smile to our protagonist's face, who asked for a moment to talk to Sivet, who, in turn, wanted to know the name of the young man standing before him. And clearly, Tuka had to introduce herself as Hattikal, which Sivet quickly realized was a fake name, likely chosen for protection. Tuka regretted not giving her real name, but Sivet understood that she had a reason to hide it. This allowed him to focus on his question, which was whether Sivet was seeking an enemy strong enough to satisfy him. Sivet didn't deny it, but Tuka wanted to know if that was truly his purpose and why he hadn't already gone after powerful enemies, using the goddess of Alien as an example. Sivet revealed that his homeland, Bakos, had always maintained good relations with Alien, so he couldn't bring himself to confront the goddess. However, he had high hopes for the heroes the goddess brought into this world, as her blessing always helped them reach their full potential. For this reason, he would never fight the goddess herself, believing that one day, a warrior might rise to challenge him. This made Tuka realize that Sivet was completely sincere and genuinely desired to face a strong opponent soon, as it was his only wish in the world. In the end, Tuka devised the perfect plan to survive. She went straight to her enemy and offered to introduce him to a powerful foe capable of ending his life, Tuka herself. This surprised Sivet, but in a good way. As the young man continued talking about the goddess of this world and those who were blessed to become the strongest, Tuka revealed that she was one of these blessed individuals, reintroducing herself honestly as Tam Mamori, a hero from another world. This revelation shocked everyone, especially her new friend, and even more so Sivet, who seemed thrilled to have a hero standing before him. Sivet then asked what someone like Tuka was doing in this place. Knowing that Sivet could likely detect lies, Tuka admitted that she had been individually tested against all her companions, which was why she could do things they couldn't while they trained with the goddess. Sivet, seeing no deception, continued to ask what made Tuka so special to have such a privilege. Tuka admitted that it was because she was in a league entirely different from the others, which was both a lie and a truth. As an E-class hero, she was different from the group, 
but Sibbet understood that she was an exceptionally powerful being, which intrigued him even more, especially since she was special even to the goddess. Sibbet was willing to listen to any proposal from Tuka, who asked for a brief respite, just a small amount of time. Tuka planned to use this time to become strong enough to ensure she could defeat Sibbet, even making the goddess kneel before her after completing her mission. Sibbet, however, wanted to know how a hero like her would accomplish this. Tuka revealed that she intended to go to the land of the eyed monsters, as part of a mission from the goddess herself. This was partially true since the goddess had indeed ordered Tuka to return to the surface when it was clear she couldn't survive. However, the promise that her life would be spared upon her return still held strong. This convinced Sibbet, as he realized that by simply waiting a little longer, he could face a formidable opponent, thus sparing Tuka's life for the time being. Yet, there was still the issue of Ash Rain. Tuka began to defend her, explaining that she needed Ash Rain's strength to reach their cherished destination. Although this was beyond Sibbet's orders, he detected no lies in Tuka's words and decided to let Ash Rain live, provided she grew stronger. One of the Black Dragon's members attempted to contradict Sibbet, but he wouldn't allow anyone to interfere with his goal of facing a powerful being. This led to a poignant farewell, with Sibbet eagerly promising Tuka that the next time they met, it would be in an epic battle. Despite the temporary truce, Tuka wasn't done. She capitalized on the moment when her great enemy turned his back, seizing the advantage she had been waiting for. She swiftly used paralysis on the entire group, leaving them immobilized. Even the planet's most powerful being struggled to barely move. As Tuka mocked the vast difference in their powers, she began to poison all the members, including their leader, who could only watch the young man with hatred. This scene struck Tuka, as only the Soul Eater had managed to resist her paralysis like this in the past. Yet, even Sivit could only move within his limits without being able to wield a weapon. At the moment Matama died, a light ascended from his body to the sky, which Tuka believed to be a survival mechanism that revived the rest of the group. Without Sivit leading them, they posed little threat to the young man, who, with Ashrain's help, prepared to face the remaining soldiers. They could only hear their dying leader's orders to stay back and kill the two enemies from a distance. Tuka took advantage of the situation by using a new skill. Though it took a long time to activate and consumed many magic points, it was incredibly powerful. With enough time, she immediately used Pigamaro to launch her bonded creature at the enemies, paralyzing them with a single touch. This was the upgrade she had been working on, which allowed her to put the rest of the dragons to sleep and poison them simultaneously. Yet, the strongest being in the world managed to survive a few more seconds before finally succumbing to Tuka's poison, leaving both her and her new friend free from many problems for the time being. Ashrain finally agreed to join Tuka on the journey, grateful for all the trouble Tuka had gone through to help her. Meanwhile, Tuka's other companions were fighting to level up and acquire unique abilities. A young girl named Keypad appeared, sent by the goddess Vicios. This didn't sit well with Oyamata, who thought she was too small to train them. However, within seconds, something happened that showed she wasn't as weak as she seemed. Later that night, Tuka revealed her entire backstory to Ashrain, explaining why she was so determined to seek revenge on the goddess. Despite the heavy revelation, her friend was not frightened and vowed to protect Tuka until her debt was repaid. This also led to another promise from Tuka, who swore that one day, she would do something similar for Ashrain in return. 